Amen. Well, let's uh, give it up for our song singers one more time. And uh, why don't we turn our Bibles over to Luke chapter 19. And as you turn there, I want you to consider today, as you hear the words of God, answer the question, who is Jesus to you? What was his message? What did he come to earth to do? What was his mission? You know, there's so many ideas out there in our modern day religious society. Some say he came to bring peace on earth. Some say he was a prophet who came to bring social reform. Some say he was God in the flesh, but all he wants is for you to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, and you don't really need change at all. But here this morning, we're not concerned with what they say. We're concerned on what the Bible says. And I believe as we turn to Luke 19, we will see in verse 10 the message of Jesus. You guys there? Verse 10 of Luke 19 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. You see, right here is the message of Jesus. When he sees the lost world, he sees the abuse, he sees the morality, he sees the impurity, he sees all the darkness, and it says that he came to seek and, and save what is lost. But we know what the Bible says in 1 John 2, it says that anyone who claims to be in him will live like him. So this is the message of Christ, but it's also the message of the body of Christ. That we also see the darkness that we were all once were at a time. That we were all, as Ephesians 2 says, that we were alive but dead in our transgressions. We were alive but dead to our sins. But when the body of Christ came to us, the arm of the Lord that's not too short to save, it came to us through a disciple of Jesus. And you heard what it meant to be saved. That is the thesis of Jesus' life. That is the message of Jesus. That is the mission of the church. You see, that is the great Christian mission, and that's the title of my lesson here this morning, The Christian Mission. And uh, I just got to say, one, I bring you greetings from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Coachella Valley, amen. Um, I, you know, it's feel like we've been gone for a long time, uh, but it's great to be back with the family. And I was so fired up to preach for a men's midweek, but I'm also very fired to be with you guys here this morning. Uh, I think we've had an incredible service so far. Uh, one, I just want to, before I go there, I want to say thank you to Caleb Henry who's helping me out with the PowerPoint over here. And we got some pictures to show you guys from our trip. And I want to lift up my incredible wife who did an awesome job at Women's Day. And what an incredible service we had so far. Thank you to Andre and Kiana for an incredible welcome. Uh, the contribution message by Matthew was stirring and inspiring. And we know this is our deadline, guys, for special missions. And I know we're going to blow it on out for the Lord. And what an incredible testimony by Sharon Kirshner. Thank you so much for uh, really sharing your heart and bringing us to the cross. You know, it was once said, the evangelization of the world does not wait on the readiness of God, but on the obedience of Christians. We understand that God has done his part. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That God came down from heaven, gave, us the, gave up his divinity for us, and sacrificed himself on the cross. And he done his part, but now his mission is left to us as disciples. Are we going to go out and seek and save the lost. And today we're going to study out a parable. And if you don't know what a parable is, a parable is a physical story that has a spiritual meaning behind it that comes directly after this verse. 
the parable of the ten minas. I've heard some say the par parable of the ten minas, but I do believe the pronunciation. I asked Jim Parker to make sure that I got it right. Uh, it is the parable of the ten minas right there. So let's continue going on in verse 11. But it could be tomato, tomato, you know what I'm saying? Oh, let's give it up for Augustine as well, who's helping out with yeah. AB here. We got, we got the, the, the wireless mic for you guys. Thank you. Amen. Oh. Amen. Let's give it up for Augustine, guys. So, you know, I love the NIV Bible because it does break down different subjects for us as we read. But I think sometimes that could trip us up. We might think there may be a break of thought from one verse to the other. In reality, what we see in verse 11, let's read it right now. It says, while they're listening to this, he wanted to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So we understand that they were listening to Jesus talking about seeking and saving the lost. And it says, while they're listening to him, they heard this parable. So there's no break in thought here. We know that this parable is all about seeking and saving the lost. And we know that this is part of the journey section, which is really the, the climax of this passage of scripture, where Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem, where we understand that's where he died for our sins. So this parable we're about to read is something unique to the book of Luke, but I believe it's so important, and it does tell the story of the Christian mission. The parable of the ten minas. Let's now read verse 12. It says, he said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to, no, then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. But this, he said, put this money to work until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent the delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. Let's stop right there. So here is something very unique to this parable. It's the only parable Jesus teaches that uses a current event in the story. So in 4 BC, there's a man named Herod the Great that becomes king of the Jews. He dies in 4 BC, and then they thought that his son Herod Antipas will become king. But instead, he chooses his son, Herod Archelaus, and they want him to become the king of the Jews. The issue with that was the Jews hated this man because he caused a rebellion that led to thousands of Jews being killed. And we understand that during this time, the Jews were enslaved to the Roman Empire. So before they were anointed king, they had to get permission from Rome and go all the way there and talk to Caesar Augustus. And the way the story goes is Herod Archelaus then goes to Rome, but then the Jews send 50 delegates of embassy of men to stop him from becoming king. So what Caesar Augustus does, instead of making him king, he makes him an ethnarch, which means a ruler of ethnicities. So that was what they did, and they compromised. But Jesus uses that story to grab the people because they understand what's going on, but there's a twist in his story. This time, the person that they didn't want to become king actually becomes king. Wow. Who's that noble man that came from a distant country? That's talking about King Jesus yeah. coming from heaven, and people didn't want Jesus to be king. They didn't want to make him Lord. They didn't want to give up their lives. They didn't want to bow down to the king of kings. But we know from Philippians 2 that every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, and it doesn't matter if you don't want to make Jesus king. He will be the king of kings, the Lord of lords, our savior, Jesus Christ. That's the story. So they try to stop him, but he does become king. And then what's so amazing, it says this noble man then gives ten servants each Amina. Amina was worth three months' wages. Can you imagine how awesome that would be if you got three months' wages right now? Man, whoa, just blowing out special missions right now. You know what I'm saying? And that's what he gives them. And then he tells them, 
I'm giving you this freely. What does that represent? Well, Ephesians 2 says that nobody can be saved by works, but we're saved by the grace of God. Yeah. And isn't that amazing? That the, it's by the grace of God that we are saved. So that mina is supposed to represent your salvation. But then he says, put this money to work. Yeah. As Ephesians 2 says, that we're not saved by works, but we are saved to work. Right. Our first point, put the money to work. Yeah. And we know what this money is representing. It's representing our salvation. But I think, you know, it's so incredible. We had a great Women's Day this past Saturday. And it's to my knowledge, there's a lot of guests here. We're so grateful that many guests came to worship with us. But I think we just first have to get is on straight. How do we get salvation? How do you cross over from the darkness to the light? How do you get your life right with God? How do you receive that mina? How do you receive that grace? Because many will say different things, guys. Many will say, all you got to do is say a prayer. Many will say, all you got to do is accept Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Many will say, all you got to do is baptize your baby, then confirm it later. But we got to see, what does the Bible say? Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, verse 36. But let's drop down to verse 38. We see... What did Peter say to get people saved? It says, after they asked what they got to do to respond to the cross, Peter says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all the Lord who God will call. With many words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. So how do we get that free gift of God? Well, you must respond to the cross of Christ. By making a decision to repent of your sins, that means changing away from the darkness and marching on over to the light. And then making a decision to call on the name of the Lord by being baptized into Christ. And then after that and only then someone can be saved and get their sins forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit, which is that deposit that the Bible is talking about in Luke 19 that God wants you now to put to work as he's re expecting a return of investment. And it's awesome today that at this service we are come to see three people be baptized into Christ. We have Angela in the West and Israel and Ebenezer in the Southland. They're going to come and come to the stage and they're going to say, Jesus is Lord. And then they go outside there and then when they get baptized, they get their sins forgiven. They enter the kingdom of God. They receive that free minor. But then God expects them to put the money to work. It's the grace of God that we're here. And it's amazing that God gives opportunity to respond to that grace. And there's a man who understood this very well. That man, his name was Paul. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. I want to inspire you for our guests here today. Just get in the word of God with the person who invited you. And understand, how can you also become like these people who are getting baptized today? And how can you too receive the free gift of God? But then, as a disciple, once you get that gift, God does say you got to put it to work. And a man who understood that was Apostle Paul. And to read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, something so powerful. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I, was I or they. That's what we preach, and this is what you believed. Over here, we see the Apostle Paul who says, I don't even deserve to be an apostle. And we understand why he's saying because this man was a persecutor of the way. That before he would kill Christians, this was his profession, was murdering disciples. He would try to get them to denounce Jesus. So then, what Paul would try to do, he would try to get them to denounce Jesus. Whether they said yes or no, he'll kill them no matter what. So he's trying to get people to lose their salvation before he murdered them. That's what this man did. 
And because he said, I don't want to serve to be here. And it motivated him to work hard. He says, not even I. It was the grace of God that worked in me. So when I'm tired, I still keep going. What did we learn from this passage and what did we learned from the parable of Ten Minas? Grace motivates. That's how you put the money to work. Do you understand, guys? It's by the grace of God we get to be here. That's by the grace of God that we get an opportunity to get our soul saved. It's by the grace of God to get an opportunity to hear amazing songs and get the sweet fellowship. But sometimes we can forget that. Like, man, why does my Bible talk leader ask me about special missions again? Dang, I got to share my faith right now. I'm tired. Do you understand, though? It's the grace of God that we're here, guys. That we have opportunity one day to see God in heaven. And that grace motivates us to put our money to work. Are you guys with me here? You know, I just got to lift up the church. I mean, I believe we have some hardworking disciples here. I mean, in 10 weeks, we've seen in the L.A. church over 150 baptisms. And 25 of them over here in the Metro Coast. And the Bible does say to acknowledge those who work hard among you. And at this time, I want to acknowledge some people. Why does God acknowledge the ushering team? Um, what I want to really lift up Uncle Eddie over there, Eddie Anderson. Do you guys understand Eddie works overnight to get here early to serve us? That's the grace of God in him. Doesn't complain about it and comes here and gives his heart. That's the grace of God working through him and all the other ushers with Jonathan Frank and all them, serving us with smiles, making sure that we get our little envelopes, making sure we got our communion cups, and making sure you know where to sit down. <laughs> it's amazing. I want to look at the AV team. They do so much. There's Eddie over there. Hey, if you haven't been to Eddie's house, you got to go to Eddie's house. And he makes some awesome ribs. He's, he's, he was great. And it was great to share with the, some of the, the ushers over there. But the AV team as well, they did, you know, sacrifice so much for our social media team. Augustine, Ashley, Galilea, Valentina, all of them. It's the grace of God working in them. All the Bible talk leaders working hard to see those people get their soul saved. But I do want to lift up our congregational leaders, Jason and Sarah. You have to understand, man, like Sarah poured herself out in all these women's days. Jason went to Brazil, poured himself out. Went to Las Vegas, poured himself out. Went to Tampa Bay, poured himself out. That's the example. That's the grace of God working in them. And I think it was so special yesterday on our Women's Day to see Hannah get baptized. She's the daughter of Jim and Michelle Parker, who just recently placed membership with us last year on the ICOC. Like, you understand, these people have been, long, been disciples longer than some of you have been born. I mean, they've been, the disciples, they've been disciples longer than I've been alive. That's saying a lot. And we can learn so much from that example because it's the grace of God that motivates them. And that led to then their daughter, Hannah. Also responding to the grace of God. And yesterday she said, Jesus is Lord. And she got baptized into Christ. We're seeing the power of God work through the grace of God. And people are putting their money to work. But let's be honest. Can I be honest with the church here? Is it okay to challenge the church here? You know, it was great being in Brazil. They're around the same number of disciples of the super region. And it was awesome. I mean, I spoke about it at Campus Devo in midweek. They sang the glory song, but before then, I didn't understand what they're saying because in Portuguese. But I understood the spirit, though. <laughs> before then, they had a future GNN. And in that GNN, the good news was we got the job done. And then before they sang the glory song, they saw nine baptisms and three restorations. That's amazing. And... For me, when I came back last week, the super region had no baptisms. 240 disciples, no baptisms. We understand Acts 11, when Barnabas saw the grace of God 
And what he says is that a great number of disciples came to the Lord and were baptized. What does that teach us? Great grace equals great numbers. People persecute us about numbers. Well, at the end of the day, every number represents a soul. And when I don't see, thank God, now we've seen some people get baptized this week. But when I see that, it's teaching me something. There are some among us who are not putting their money to work. Who may not be motivated by grace. Or there's some who are motivated, but you're getting a little tired. And the beauty about grace, Paul says, it wasn't even me working. It was the grace of God that was working. It's like it, it takes over you. So zeal is a tireless diligence to achieve a goal. So it's okay if you're tired. we got to renew and go back to the grace of God and be motivated by the grace of God. It's time to renew so we can see more souls be saved all around Los Angeles. Now I want to put a prayer go before the church. Uh, I think I was so inspired to by the GNN, you know, with the, the, the Haitian brothers and sisters over there brought me to tears. That's the grace of God. Pushing themselves to save as many as possible. Now I'm going to put it before the church here to have a prayer goal. That we have some March Madness in the month of March. That we can see 20 people get baptized. And really go after one for more studies for the whole super region. And really what, how we're going to do that is by responding to the grace of God making a decision to put our money to work so we can see more people get their life right with God. Are you guys with me here? Let's go to point number two. Faithful with little. Let's go back to Luke 19 and finish the parable. All right, so we, fig we figured out here that 10 servants each get a mina or a mina. Let's see tomato, tomato. Let's, let's see what they do with it. Verse 16 of Luke 19, the Bible says, The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I've kept it and laid it away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I'll judge you by your own words. Yeah. You wicked servant. You knew you did, did you? That I'm a hard man. Taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I do not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit? So when I come back, I could have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. So they said, that he already has ten. He replied, tell you that everyone who has more, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Man, Jesus just loves twists. Sometimes you look at that like, man, that's not the Jesus I learned about it in elementary school or Sunday school. But that is the Jesus of the Bible. Faithful with little. One gets one. Gets ten more. God says, here are ten cities. One gets five more. God says, here are five cities. They were faithful with little. God gave them more. What does that teach us? That you will be rewarded according to your work. And God teaches from this passage that you must earn the right to lead. You must earn it. Be faithful with the little that God gives you, and then he will give you more. If you're not faithful with little, God will not give you more. I don't envy the person that takes the elevator in the kingdom. I don't envy the person that goes up and is raised up without being faithful with little. It's only going to ruin them. It's only going to hurt them. And that's the principle of God. Then there's another one. He hides it. Why does he hide it? He had the wrong perspective of God. He said, God, you're a hard man. Is that the truth? 
did he not reward the men according to what they did? That sounds just to me. His perspective of God paralyzed him. And I believe the same thing as disciples at times. We lose our perspective of God. We stop seeing him as a loving father. We stop seeing him as our master. And then it paralyzes us. That we no longer are faithful with little. And we stop believing in the promises of God. You know, around 1876, there was a black man named Booker T. Washington. Who wanted to get an education. And back then, sadly, for African Americans... It was very rare to get one. But there's one school that was accepting people so that he can get education. But when he gets there, they said they're maxed out. But they told him what he can do is sweep the floors, and he could possibly get a spot in class. He takes that menial task. He sweeps the floors, and he becomes a student at university. And we know now Booker T. Washington is one of the most famous philosophers, authors, and orators of the civil rights movement that really inspired that. But where did it come from? It came from being faithful with little, sweeping the floor. Sweeping the floor. He said, I'm going to do it. So whatever task you get, whether it be getting coffee, whether it be, you know, watching the kids, whether it be uh, 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 ushering or singing or leading a Bible talk, you got to take that small thing and give it all you got. I got to ask you, are you really giving all you got right now? Are you being faithful with the little that God's giving you? Because here's the thing, here's an opportunity here. Now, I do want to lift up Matt and Selma. We had, we had a fun time at Women's Day. I don't think it's by coincidence. We know, Matt and I knew very well that our time was going to be short together in the Super Region. Because we're like, man, you're going to do some incredible things going for the Lord. And I appreciate Matt because it's been nothing but a joy being with them. But it's no coincidence that they're now going to become super region leaders over there in the East Region. Now, why is that? They were been, they've been faithful with little. And the revival in the West Region has been incredible to see. But here's the opportunity. We know we're going to welcome the Grizzlies and their team with great love when they do come. But we know with Matt and Selma leaving, there's a great opportunity for many to step up. Are you ready for that challenge? You know how you're going to answer that? You're not going to answer that by just saying it. You're going to be answering that by being faithful to the little you have right now. And really what can stop someone? Really what, what was wrong with that man who hid his meanness? He did not embrace the pressure of multiplying it. If you're going to be faithful with little, I think people are like, oh, don't talk about pressure in the church. <laughs> Jesus Christ died for you. A lot, lot, lot of pressure in his wrist. A lot of pressure in his feet. There's going to be pressure to this. Here's the thing. Some of us think raising a mission is going to get easier. It's not going to get easier. <laughs> It's only going to get harder. I got to ask you today, do you embrace pressure? Do you love it? Come on, Ole. You're like, oh, man, I love that pressure. I can't lie, man. I got a haircut to this, this week. I was, like, I was looking a little shabby there. And I was shocked. I saw a gray hair. I was shocked. 28. <laughs> 28, man. God's got great. I was like, oh, my Lord. But what it is? What's happened? It, it's, it's, I believe it's just feeling the pressure. It was a high pressure. Some of us were selling ding-dongs. Like, I was at Dominguez Hill selling cupcakes. That's me, hey, man. We're trying to raise money here. You, you, want, you want to buy a cupcake? Follow the OPA. I know some of us felt that pressure, and you gotta, you gotta get you, you broke a little bit this week. But it's okay. Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 to 11, jot it down. He said that 
bit. I don't want you to be un uninformed about the pressure and trials we faced in the province of Asia. But all those things happen so I can learn how to rely on God. It's the only way we're going to make it, guys. If you try to rely on strength, you're going to die. But if you rely on God, you will be faithful with little. I really want to challenge us as we close out the first quarter of the year. Here's the thing, guys. It's only March. <laughs> it's a lot of year left. And I really want to inspire us here that we got to be faithful with little by embracing the pressure of Christ. Point number three, the return of the king. Well, what a twist we saw in that passage. It's a bit shocking. Some of, I saw some of your faces. You're like, Jesus said that? He said, that guy who's unfaithful and all the people that said they didn't want to make him king, bring him and bring them in front of me. And kill them. We know that one day Christ is gonna come back. The return of the king. And when that day comes, the question is will he find faith here on earth? And the faithful disciples are gonna be those who are gonna to go to be with him in heaven. And the year of blessings, the spirit is moving. As you can see here behind me, this year we're planting 24 new churches. Yeah. And I think what's so amazing about this, I hope your heart was moved by the GNN. My heart was. This is personal. To see what's happening in Haiti. To see what's happening around the world. To see what's, what's happening and all the different churches, it's just personal. Even this 24 plantings this year, we take it very personal. Can we know that one, JP and Michaela, they're going to South Carolina. And it's amazing to see that they're a homegrown disciple here in San Francisco, and now they're going to go plant a church. Anything special to me as well is Ashton and Cara. They're going to North Carolina. I think it's obviously their growth because we were in the same ministry together and I had the opportunity to study the Bible with Ashton and help baptize him. And to see him now, now he's going to lead a church with his wife, Cara. And don't forget about our dear sister, Liza. Who, I mean, the good news is amazing. Nine disciples had 88 people in attendance. And we sent her off just last year. And it's amazing what God is doing over there in Fiji. Yeah. And we know that, oh, that's it. Amen. Amen. Well, we don't know what that's going to say, but <laughs> we could continue going. We know that this year, after those plantings in America, we're going to see Operation Eagle be complete. Wow. And we're going to have a church in every single state in America. One may say, well, why are we doing that? Aren't there churches everywhere? Well, we understand that God wants a movement. He wants people to go and seek and save the lost. And we believe that is the call of every single Christian. That is indeed the Christian mission. And now, 42 disciples that came from Portland to Los Angeles have now multiplied to over 11,000, wow. to over 170 churches, and over 60 nations. I believe God will find faith here on earth through the disciples. God's going to come back. And the question is, will we will be ready. And I ask you here this morning, are you ready to meet your Lord? Because we don't know when God's going to come back. Yeah. But we do know we want to be ready. 
Let's close out with Revelation chapter 22. Verse 16. We're going to read in verse 12. It says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I'll give it to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. See, God is coming back. And what he wants us to do before he returns is to complete the Christian mission. To put our salvation to work. To be faithful with little so that one day, guys, we're going to go before our Lord, and we're going to see the glory of God. On, and he will reward us according to what we have done. Yeah. And we'll be with God's people of all time in heaven forever. Yeah. But until then, it's time for us to complete the Christian mission, and to God be the glory. Oh,